Around Australia, a battle is raging. And for three years, the manor was on its front line. Until December 2009, it housed a rehab facility called the Victorian Addiction Centre. <laughs> for two months prior to the centre's relocation, a single camera was given unprecedented access. You should have had a T-shirt on saying life sucks. To capture the pain, hope and recovery of its final intake of addicts. I'll think about you. Everyone here is a normal person. They just have a disease of addiction. These gamblers, drinkers and drug users are also mums, dads, sons and daughters. And these are their stories. If I don't stop using and drinking, I'll be dead before April next year. Suburban Australia. A sprawl of wide streets and green lawns that lie at the heart of the Australian dream. But these neighbourhoods also play host to a sinister secret. Addiction. An estimated one in ten Australian families have been touched by alcohol or drug dependence. Every day, in our cities and our country towns, addictions ruin lives, tear families apart and kill. Some of the luckier addicts wind up here, in the Melbourne suburb of Ivanhoe at a rehab known as The Manor. This morning, 46-year-old Denise is doing wake-up calls. This is our young pup. James! She's yeah. one of 12 addicts okay. currently doing rehab at the Victorian Addiction Centre. They're all undergoing a 28-day program, and when they leave, they'll have access to outpatient support and therapy for two years. Morning. Here at the manor, they'll inhabit a strange world with no drugs, no booze, no mobile phones and no unsupervised trips outside. But what makes the manor different from most other rehabs is that the addicts here don't focus solely on their addiction. I would pull into the driveway, throw the stubby in the bin. Instead, they confront its underlying cause. What the fuck is tonight's argument going to be about? And it would start. One of the fascinating things about people who use drugs, uh, they'll often say, I, I use drugs, I use booze, I mean, it makes me feel great, it's a reward for all the good things I've done, whereas in reality what they're often doing is they're trying to block out all these painful emotions uh, that they uh, don't want to be able to deal with. This rehab is built on the belief that drug and alcohol abuse is usually a method of coping with distress. So, of course, when I found the speed, I was seriously depressed, I was suicidal, I had this eating disorder. It just solved all my problems like that. Therapists and psychologists help the addict strip away years of shame and repression. Before they were many walks of life, having to conceal and hide what To find the emotional root of their addiction and reveal it to the group. Dad died in 1990 and, uh, I started using heroin then, just up the ante, basically. Sometimes it's not just one, it may be one, two, three, four, five different things, and they gradually need, just like weeding a garden, isn't it? You've got to go through and get all that stuff out, otherwise the new plants are gonna, not going to grow. I'm not scared into sobriety, but I want it more than anything. And that's what I pray for every morning. If folks are not honest, uh, if they continue to deny, if they hold things back, it's the equivalent of treading water. So those people are highly likely to relapse if they have stayed in denial and they're likely to need to come back round the circuit again at another time. Today, there's a new arrival at the manor who knows the cycle of relapse all too well. Cut off the detox <laughs> tag and stick on the rehab tag. OK, these are Medicare. Yep. So I need a signature in both boxes there. Matthew has just spent seven days drying out in a detox centre. 
For the next 28 days, he plans to be calling the manor home for the third time. Last two. Yep. <laughs> These are just the health fund claim forms. Rehab here costs over $600 a day. In Matthew's case, that fee will be covered with the assistance of private health insurance and his family. But the work experience nurse who is checking Matthew in is suspicious of his demeanour. <laughs> uh, just his mannerism, really. He was quite out there. Um, very, very pleased. <laughs> you, you could just really tell he was quite high on something, so he had taken something um, on his journey to um, the rehab. Very, 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 very pleased. <laughs> There's no place for illicit drugs in rehab, and Matthew's about to be subjected to an unexpectedly thorough search. While one addict checks in, another is preparing to say goodbye. 31-year-old Jean-Paul has reached the end of his program and is looking forward to a new start. For me, it's just, I just know that that's something that I don't want to do for the rest of my life, is to use heroin. It's just, yeah, I've done it. I've done it for 12 years, and um, I think I've had enough, you know. Incredibly, Jean-Paul's tried rehab and detox over <clears throat> 30 times, but he's never completed a program until today. I honestly didn't um, expect or know whether or not I could get to this point. Um, the last step uh, of Jean-Paul's rehab is a group farewell. Because last time I was here, I was a, a little shit. <laughs> and, um, the remaining addicts are at different stages of their rehab. Some are in their third week. Others, like Mick, have only been here a few days. There's a couple of people in here that I've sort of connected with. Your one, and um, use your attitude, will help me very much. Good luck. Good on you. Look after yourself. I meant that. Every time we dare, I'll think about you. While Jean Paul is an old hand at rehab, this is Mick's first time. I'm sort of still in a detox situation at the moment. Yeah, because I never had that opportunity. I was straight in. A place came up, so I'm in. So. I'm still in the, in, the, in the shakes. His body is shaking as it tries to cope with withdrawal from alcohol. On top of his booze and marijuana addictions, Mick has an obsessive compulsive disorder. I hate it, it's the obsessive part of everything. And they do it on purpose to me, they rearrange them, move them backwards and forwards, or throw the things all over the table on purpose. Little things annoy me. Big things I don't care, but little things annoy me. An alcoholic for 30 years, Mix finally decided enough's enough. Don't you dare. Jane. I'm here for the 28 days. Everyone here is a normal person. They just have a disease of addiction. I've got a picture of um, my niece and nephew. I'm not allowed to see them. Until such time I'm sober, I scare them apparently. We get on famously, but if they say if they're there on a Saturday over the period of the day, we get drunker and drunker, and might get louder and louder and a bit rowdy and a bit rougher with them. And I scared them apparently. They told their father, my brother, um, and I wasn't aware of that. I'm, so, I'm doing this for myself, but the, the, I have to do it for other people too. Today, under the guidance of clinic nurse Mary Waters, Mick must tell his life story to the group. Okay, guys, it's Michael's life story. Mick. It's a required part of his rehab, but because Mick's in withdrawal, his emotions are raw. Are you just looking? All right, yep. I'm just going to get in the moment. Gather yourself together. While Mick struggles to contain his nerves, new arrival Matthew is under pressure of a different kind. Is this the way that they... No, 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 this is, this is uh, standard. Yeah, we have to do a thorough search, I'm sorry. But in truth, work experience nurse Bridget is searching for drugs a lot more thoroughly than his usual practice at the manor. 
She's also looking for other restricted items, like mobile phones or portable music players. They're banned because they discourage group participation. Last time, um, I went to great lengths to smuggle my MP3 player in, in my jocks. <laughs> <laughs> Robin felt the need to do that this time. I don't know. It just depends on the nurse. Some people will do it exceptionally thoroughly, as our friend is doing now. Exceptionally thoroughly. <laughs> and some people just yeah, don't really bother all that much. <laughs> Bridget's being hyper-vigilant, so it's no surprise when Matthew loses his sense of humour. Um, uh, where's he going? Yeah, back. Sorry. Well, he's gone somewhere. Outside, recovering heroin addict Jean-Paul is being picked up by his grandmother. Before he leaves, he says goodbye to program manager Tina. Well, yeah. And you look fantastic, Thanks. and, and I, I think you've good. got a good plan. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. And you ring us early rather than later, aren't right? you? Yes. If you're thinking about things and you think you might have a problem, you give us a buzz then. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Don't I wait definitely. till you walk John out. Paul has made a recovery plan to help him stay Come off heroin. Up. And Come Tina up. knows if he doesn't stick to it, he's likely to go back to using. Yeah. Our expectations are that if people walk out the door and do nothing else, that 90% of them are going to relapse within a 12-month period. Addiction is a chronic relapsing disease, in fact, very much like uh, arthritis, asthma, and those illnesses. The relapse rates are very, very similar. And uh, what's one trying to achieve is long-term stability, not a cure. There really is no cure for asthma, there's no cure for arthritis, there's no cure at the moment for diabetes, and there's no cure for addictions. Try to but like other diseases, addictions can be managed. The key is teaching addicts alternative coping skills. Falling into awareness, dropping into awareness of what is going on for you in this moment. Skills like mindful meditation, which has its origins in Buddhist teachings. We use psychological treatments. So things like cognitive behavioural therapy and mindfulness are very important ways in which people can understand their illness and change their behaviours. In fact, I can remember the first time... But before they can begin to recover, the addicts must be upfront about every aspect of their addiction. In the group therapy room, Mick has got a handle on his nerves and is narrating his path to alcoholism. He started drinking as a teenager and later joined the army. The culture in the military is very alcohol orientated. It's sort of, and in fact, it nearly becomes compulsory. It's, you just drink, 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 and drink. There's booze everywhere, wherever you go, there's facilities to drink. But Mick found out that hangovers and army drills did not mix. So he began using marijuana as well. But we had a room inspection one morning and just a surprise one. I mean, um, they opened the cupboards and the bomb was still smoking. It was still coming out, so I was in the shit for that and through the process um, kicked out, which was just supported me very, very greatly because that was my ambition, that was my career to be a career soldier. So I fucked that up. Sorry. No. Mick fell back on his trade yeah. as a painter and decorator, so, and his drinking increased. I was just saying, yeah, I'd just come home from work, sit in the garage, just drinking, drinking. I'd, I'd had a third of a bottle of drink in the, in, inside two minutes. I'd just guzzle it, you know, and have a few more bombs. Boom, boom, back in the room again, have another go. And in the end, I didn't put the top back on the bottle. I just left it. Now, 49, Mick's paid a heavy toll um, for a lifetime of addiction. I've never had a relationship in my life, ever. It's probably because of, obviously, the drinking and that. My mum used to say, you probably come across Mrs Wright, but she probably stepped over you when you were passed out at some stage. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, um, yeah. But um, I'm here. My mother still lives with me in the house and she's an amputee, so I have to sort of be on the ball for her now 
had a brother who sort of vetoed my niece and nephew seeing me because I scared them and I wasn't aware of that. So, yeah, and that's why I'm here and hopefully I get to the end and, yeah, that's about it. That's me, in a nutshell. Very courageous, Michael, of you, Thank you. doing that. Yeah. Excellent. In new arrival Matthew's room, the search for drugs continues. This is unbelievable. What did you say? Just checking the collars on my shirt. Like if I wanted to bring stuff in, I just put it in my jocks, in my shoes. You know what I mean? Like I'm. How does it make it's you feel? This search is unusually thorough, but if any drugs are smuggled in, it could jeopardise not only Matthew's rehab, but that of all the other addicts. It's very invasive, but it would be awful if, you know, um, there was drugs of some sort smuggled in and, you know, the clients that had just finished their program was given something or, you know, it would be awful. The last few stops. Despite Bridget's suspicions, they haven't found any drugs in Matthew's gear. So you know about the breathalyser? Mm-hmm. I'm just going to do one of those, OK? After some medical checks, he'll be officially admitted to rehab. To a vape. Yep. Great. That's a good one. Formal therapy happens in the counselling rooms, but it's here in the courtyard that addicts relearn how to socialise without the aid of booze or drugs. I didn't drink spirits. I, I used to drink UDLs, <coughs> you know, vodka and pineapples or whatever. I'll save a bit of money for not drinking. This afternoon, Mick is getting to know James and Tim, who both started rehab at the same time as him. And he finds some common ground. <laughs> well, I'm a drinker, but it's cough medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Mick, you might not believe it, but... Oh, actually... You should just buy a bottle of jammers. If you spend that much, why not get a bit of cold heat? I've got me high as a guy, don't you worry. <laughs> Strange as it sounds, 32-year-old Tim is addicted to an over-the-counter opiate-based cough medication. A typical day would be driving around to pharmacies all over town, all over Melbourne, because um, you couldn't go to the same pharmacy all the time, so I would be pharmacy shopping and because um, it's an over-counter medication. But you take it in large enough doses and it's um, very effective at achieving a high. In the group therapy room, Tim describes how drugs have cut him off from the world. <laughs> Just uh, isolate from my friends, I turn my phone off. Yeah. I um, will not tell my parents what's going on. Yeah. Um, We're very good at setting up our environment for you, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. And um, you just won't contact anyone throughout the day and just have this, you know, be in a little bubble, yeah. you know, and just be happy and content to take your drugs and be in this little bubble and stay in it all day. As soon as you but get now Tim wants to get out of that yeah. bubble for good. There's too many things that I want to do in life and I'm 32 now and... You know, I don't want to waste any more time because you just end up existing when you take drugs and you don't, you're not living. Come on, Ben. Matt, I'll be looking after you while you're in here. It was a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah. New arrival Matthew has had a visit from GP Ben Baresi. You, you've, how many times have you done rehab before here? Twice. OK. Well, well just in, in your own words, tell us a little bit about why you've come back to us then. Like, I need to get a... A booster shot of recovery, like I've just been relapsing flat out basically since I left. Matthew's fighting an addiction to codeine pills, and lately he's been binging on alcohol and marijuana. How much, um, how much have you been drinking recently before you went into Vic Clinic? Um, probably sort of two litres of fortified wine, or a bottle and a bit of scotch, or. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. I've been mm. drinking more than more than I've ever. Like I used to drink a lot of cast wine, which just didn't get me. Like I physically couldn't drink enough liquid to keep up with 
give me an alcohol that I wanted, you know, as I just swapped a fortified wine or spirits, it was the only thing that did the job. Okay. And in the cannabis, how are you using it? What form was it in? And um, bombs and joints, uh, probably two to three grams a day. All right. Thanks. Look after yourself. For the next 28 days, there will be no bongs, joints, codeine or booze for Matthew. And if the rehab works, they will be gone from his life forever. It's a new day at the manor. And while some might expect rehab to echo with the cries of addicts in the grip of withdrawal, this place is calm and there's a reason why. Every morning, the residents line up to be medicated. This is the worst part, waiting for your medication in the queue. You know you want them and you, you sort of get impatient, you know, especially if the person in front of you is only getting vitamins or something. Mick's taking vitamins too, but he's also on sedatives for his withdrawal symptoms and another drug to deal with his anxiety. Thank you. Look at the size of that brown thing. Oh, that's, a, that's a big multi B vitamin. Mm. Clients who are prescribed drug substitutes, such as recovering codeine addict Matthew, can also take them while in rehab. I think we're um, actually the only one that will leave people on their pharmacotherapy. Um, yep. Thanks. Maddie. And it means that a lot of clients who previously couldn't have come in can now come. The codeine Matthew's addicted to is an opiate, like heroin. He takes methadone to stave off his withdrawal symptoms. Without it, he'd be a physical wreck and couldn't focus on the program. Thanks, boss. But the manor also relies on more old-fashioned healing methods, like a daily dose of fresh air and exercise, supervised by resident physiologist Clint. I uh, get them out and moving, teach them about uh, healthy, sustainable ways to live their life. And, uh, yeah, try and promote physical activity as a good way to, uh, to manage their addiction. In recent months, morning strolls like this have been few and far between for 46-year-old Denise. And it brings back lovely memories of camping trips and bushwalks and hopefully it just uh, regenerates some of the things I used to do. A gambling and alcohol addict, Denise has been through six rehabs and four detoxes in the past 10 years. I start enjoying the rehabs and when I leave, I often still isolate. And so rehabs have been a place where I start to connect with people again. Yeah, I'm just gonna feed the dog. <laughs> a dog has strayed into the center today and Denise has decided to make friends. Oh, the last 10 years I've had a dog and uh, we've isolated together. I've kind of cut her off from the world as well. And she's been a beautiful companion. So, um, yeah, I've, I've learnt to enjoy the unspoken, unconditional love of a pet, as opposed to people um, I worry about their judgments a lot. Find the dog. Denise's addictions have gradually chipped away at her life. She's gambled away her house, has few friends, and now lives in a homeless shelter. She's everybody's best friend. <laughs> Every day the addicts gather for group sessions designed to help them understand their addiction. The group itself, the group therapy, is a very powerful way in which people can look into their own behaviour, get feedback from other people and assist other people. When you're an addict, the last thing you want to do is admit it. Today, Clint is hosting a discussion about denial. Shout, intimidate in order to get our point across. Uh, so mm. the, 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 you mean drinking? No. <laughs> yeah, so we just denied. I was in denial with my... Drug addiction for a very long time until my mum sort of woke me up there. 22 year old James is the youngest addict currently in the centre. I was like, just didn't think that I used as much as what I did. He's what therapists call a poly user, someone who is addicted to a variety of drugs. 
I liked any sort of drug I could really get my hands on, to tell you the truth. Didn't feel normal if I wasn't stoned or high on something. James grew up in the regional Victorian town of Shepparton. At school, he was always in trouble. I was a bully. I turned out to have anger issues with anyone who would like argue with me or anything. Yeah, I was just a little shit. James turned to drugs to calm his anger. In rehab, he'll need to learn other ways of coping. If something gets me upset or annoys me, I'll straight away be like in anger. Instead of just like sort of shrugging it off my shoulders, I'll get really defensive. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know why. Well, oh, that's that's what we're here to explore. Yeah, that's what you're here to that's explore. That's what I think I need to work on. In rehab, everyone says they're going to change. But the daunting fact is that if they don't stick to their post-rehab plan, 90% of them will relapse within a year. Yeah, you get overwhelmed by a statistic like that. You know, you really can, like, and it did. You know. Well, you were overwhelmed. Yeah. I was like, the high rate of relapse has cough mixture addict Tim worried. It's really full on. It's almost like you're expected to fail. Bring it back to one day at a time. But I really don't want to be in the 90%, I want to be in the 10%, so I really don't want to have to come back here. Relapse also takes its toll on those who work with the addicts. Yeah, we get sad and, you know, it is heartbreaking, but we just pull ourselves up and get on with it and try and help and support them through, through their journey again if need be, you know, and that's, that's it. As much as I think this is a great place to go through a rehabilitation program, it's not somewhere I want to come back to because it's hard going. <laughs> You're looking good today, though, I must say. Oh, thanks, Tim. Are you, are you saying I don't always look good, Tim? No. Tim! I would never say that. I know you wouldn't. You're looking extra special today. Thank you so much. Look how nice the clients are. Why wouldn't I enjoy my job and love my job? And I love some clients more than others. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you have other lovers. Oh, my goodness. Don't be saying that now, because shut up. While Tim's daunted by the high rate of relapse, 49-year-old Mick's not even entertaining the thought. I've been so optimistic about it that that hasn't even crossed my mind, to tell you the truth. Mick's halfway through his program and is throwing himself into every challenge. All right, excellent. Good. Get back to some stepping. Well done, Mick. Good. I'm so determined. If someone said, oh, Mick, do you want to drink? and said, no, I'm an alcoholic. I can't. That would blow them out, I think. That's more the aim is to never have to come back to one of these places. Now you as well as giving the addicts a cardiovascular workout, so we're not to break it. Is that the aim? Not to break it. Today, Clint has planned a fun test of their hand-eye coordination. What I'd like you to do: throwing the egg up, turning around. And true to form, Mick volunteers to go first. Big for having to go. Well done. Good work. But um, yeah, I'm blaming the sun on that. that was, <laughs> Back yeah. at the manor, yeah. the I'm egg incident has that. not dented Mick's well, determination. I'm not coming back. Not like the other people here, you know. The first four people I spoke to here have all been here before, you know. People have been to detox 13 times in and out of rehab or detox. It's ridiculous. I'm doing it once. Be careful of the mentality of saying never again because there's, there's just a management system and, and try not to put sort of mm. all the time or, or none of the time. Those, those real drastics, try and, try and find a happy medium yeah, if you can. Yeah, yeah. But Mick's so determined, he's planning a permanent reminder that his drinking and drugging days are over. Denise has got a book here on Japanese and I've picked out a few appropriate words and I'll just have it tattooed in Japanese characters on my arm so it's always there just for me to... To re a reminder. The tattoo is something that you can't get rid of. It's there for the rest of your life. Every morning, every night, every time, every waking moment, that tattoo will remind me not to come back here.
program, participants are encouraged to be honest about their addiction. But they're also asked to be honest about their fellow addicts. Today, the manor's youngest client, James, will undergo the most confronting stage of his rehab. It's time for his peer evaluation. And what you're doing is you are looking at people's uh, strengths, their assets, and their weaknesses or their, or their barriers to recovery. All right, so we'll start with the barriers. All right, let's go. And then, you on. Let's go. The idea is that there's no one more qualified to spot an addict's weaknesses than other addicts. Because of your anger towards other people, that also distracts from, you know, getting well and getting better and, and your own recovery. He's trying too hard and too fast, I think, at the program, you know. You're going flat out at the thing you might burn out, you know. By the time we get to week four, it's not going to be any good for you. Grass. Cool. I've got here, initially, James showed a bit of hostility and defiance. And to me, it felt he should have had a T-shirt on saying, life sucks. That was the attitude that I got initially. But for self-confessed bad boy James, so being criticised is nothing new. What's it like to hear it from others? doesn't really, like, it's a bit of a shock for you, but you sort of just got to brush it off and take it in and try and work on that. But when James's peers start listing his strengths, he's visibly uncomfortable. For a guy that comes from Shep, you really quite got a sensitive nature about you as well. And you're able to look inward and explore yourself and that sort of thing. And so I think that's a real asset for you as well. I'm willing to change um, because, like, from when you first got here, like, you know, now you're really into it and group therapy, like, you're really participating and, and taking it seriously. I find it hard to take it on with people saying good things about me. When they all had the barriers, I had a big smile on my face. I was like, yeah, I'm ready for this. But then when they started saying good things about me, my, I sort of didn't, didn't know how to take it on. I was sort of overwhelmed. Too much. Like it was just a shock, really. Yeah, but it was good. It makes you feel good about yourself. Most addicts don't make good tenants, so finding a place to live after rehab can be a huge challenge. These people in uh, any rental accommodation are always at risk if they become intoxicated of being asked to leave because of their behaviours. And uh, we have certainly have had people we try to help that have burnt their bridges in their own family and with most of the supported accommodation that we can find around the place. And some of them we've got to start sending into state. Tim hasn't burnt his bridges with his family, but he thinks moving in with them would be a bad idea. Living at my parents' house is very isolating and I get bored and I, that is a trigger for using drugs. So I really don't think I can go back there. I don't want to. So he's meeting with Brian Cox, who runs supported accommodation for recovering addicts. Why am I in the shit all the time? Why Brian is a former alcoholic himself, and he's dedicated to helping other addicts get clean. I was the most hopeless, useless drunk that walked on God's earth, you know? If I can do it, you can do it. You're nowhere near as bad as me. I'll tell you that now. I mean, In I've Brian's houses, jails, recovering addicts live with each other and support units. each other. Yeah. You know, I need to be around people that are, you know, focused on the same thing as yeah, what yeah. I want to focus on. Yeah. Because out there, you know, I've just so much time on my hands, yeah. you know, and... Um, We've just opened up a new house and, um, you know, it's got an inbuilt swimming pool. It's nice. a beautiful house. Yeah. You know, what we generally do is give a person a week or a fortnight's trial. Yeah, that's And, fine. you know, um, and... you know, you can see how you go, you know. Yeah, give it a trial, a couple of weeks. Yep. No yep. Worries, Sounds good. See you later, mate. Thanks a lot. All the best. Tim's had a lucky break okay, yeah. that should help right. him stay on the road to recovery. <laughs> That was good. Yeah? Yeah. What do you reckon? 
I reckon it's great. I've got a good feeling about it. So, yeah, and, you know, he's pretty straight to the point, but seems like a guy that does have a heart of gold, you know, taking people in and we'll see how it goes. While Tim's looking to the future, Denise is about to delve into the past. It's her turn to tell her life story. Um, hopefully this will be a, a uh, dry-eyed... <laughs> a former teacher, Denise began drinking to calm her nerves in the classroom. I, I wasn't an authoritative teacher at all. And the combined force of that room of kids just used to overwhelm me. I was used to drink. And I remember walking around that college with um, a wicker basket and a cover on it and alcohol in there. And um, it's like my fair lady, you know, instead of flowers, there's a <laughs> bottle of alcohol in there. Um, Denise's drinking became compulsive and then at the age of 36, so did playing the pokies. And I lost a lot of money, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money. You know, there's nothing left. The flat, the car, the term deposit, the shares, I gambled the whole lot. But that made me feel good, actually. It, it always acted as a relief because it brought me down to, ah, I'm, I'm a failure. Great, that's all right. Declared bankrupt, we Denise Japan, decided to find another hobby and, and enrolled in a drama, drama class where she met her friend, Karen. And I did six months of the drama course without one bit of alcohol. Um, but the first night we did a public performance I was, I found a back room and I was guzzling alcohol and Karen walked in, I told you this, and that's the first time anyone had ever seen me drinking and it, you know, I was caught mid like that. Karen um, saw that Denise needed help and, I and offered home, her a I place to stay. Night. This is the first person that really had taken any interest and had seen my problem. For um, the next 10 years, Denise lived so with Karen and Karen's mother, Dossie. Know, and and her gambling addiction her and continued. Was, and after seven years, the bankruptcy ends. The day ended, I got all these prepaid credit cards in the mail. Got about six of them already with a credit limit. What do I do? I go out, use them all, gamble again. Uh, Before I, long, Denise had dragged her friend and into then, debt too. But we had no money. Um, and we were having Salvation Army come round with um, I suppose, food coupons and um, just thinking of the damage I did to Karen. Karen realised she could no longer support Denise's addictions oh, and, and had no choice but to ask Denise to move out. So now I'm living in a women's shelter. Um, it was advertised for homeless women with mental health problems. And that's it. Denise has managed to keep her public service job throughout her troubles. Yet she fears she's lost her best friend. But Denise's relief about finishing her life story is short-lived. Clint believes she hasn't delved deep enough. Did you not all talk out? No. He sensed that she's still keeping secrets about her addiction, and he knows she won't recover if they're not confronted. I think you did really well. I think it was a really honest account of your life story, and um, I think there's still a bit more there, I think, but you've let us, you've kind of brought the barriers back a couple of steps and, and let us in as close as we've been in a, in a while. I don't know how to get to the other bits. They might come with time. I, yeah, I, I think sometimes it's, it's something that I've noticed is that you are not willing to take a risk for fear perhaps of how other people might respond. Would you, would you point that out to me if you uh, see yeah, it? Absolutely, I can't. absolutely. Uh, it's probably just like my arm. I don't know I do it because I've yeah, done it for so long. Yeah. For now, for now Denise isn't ready to open up any further kind of and that might make her vulnerable when she leaves rehab. Why do we talk about tobacco in an addiction program? 
Every week, Professor Whelan hosts a lecture. Today, the subject is the addiction that kills more people than any other, smoking. Five million people die each year worldwide from tobacco related illness. But Professor Whelan is wasting his breath on 24 year old Matthew. And the main gas is carbon monoxide. I'm not here to be hassled about smoking, and I've seen it two times already, and I'm just not interested. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I've got much bigger fish to fry than cigarettes right now. Rehab here at the manor relies on addicts drawing strength from the group, but Matthew's found it hard to fit in. Yeah, I don't feel particularly connected to anyone here, and... Like, I wouldn't say that I've got no, no feelings for them at all, but I just don't feel connected to them in the sense that I feel like I want to open up to them and I feel that I could go to them and tell them, you know, what's really going on for me and, and that I'd, I'd get sort of a response that would, would make me feel better. Matthew knows how hard it is to kick an addiction and he doesn't rate his fellow addict's chances. I've been through here twice before, and you see the people, and they're all, you know... They've all got their plans and, and ideas, and, you know, they're all going to be great, and they're going to see each other when they get out, and they've got all these wonderful ideas about what's going to happen for them in the future and stuff like that. It never happens. 90% of people bust within the first week, and, and I can guarantee, I could pick out a few that I know are just gone. Like, I know from the way that they're thinking, from talking to me and thinking about the future, um, that they're gone. So how does it make you feel, then, about your chances of success when you leave here? It's Sunday, and here at the manor, that means visitors' day. It's a milestone, you stuck it out. Yeah, it's one of the hardest things I've done in my life, for sure. You know, and as you said, there were a couple of days... While Tim's talking to his mum about finishing the program, young poly addict James has guests of his own. His mum, Margaret, and stepdad, Ross. To hear people actually say that you are a general, like a very nice person, that you are good and everything. They've noticed a big difference in James. His acceptance or his attitude has changed dramatically. Three weeks ago, dialogue like this would have been impossible. Had the phone in one hand, he would have had the phone or I would have wouldn't have been able to just keep a steady conversation about it. to go into your mates in town. Yeah, to go and do other things. You know, this is the first time we've seen mm. this sort of attitude in him, that, that he's understanding where he is and what he needs to do to, to fix it and that uh, mum and dad aren't so silly after all, you know, some of the things that, that we've said. Yeah, are, um, actually true. Yeah, we're fairly straight sort of people, but we do understand where you've been and what's happened to you and all that, you know, you, mm. you realise a lot of these things. So. And it's finally dawning on James that his addiction has taken its toll on his family. I've put him through a lot of stress, and I know that. And you don't realise that until you come to a place like this, how much stress you've actually put on him. I think far out. Mm -hmm. uh oh, I should have listened to him, should have listened to him, but you think you know better. And you really, you don't. But one of the addicts doesn't have any visitors. Mick is tidying up his already very tidy room. You know, I'll get up later and I'll re-straighten it. I'll have it rearranged. That's just how I am, unfortunately. After three weeks in rehab, Mick's opening up about the incident he believes contributed to his addictions and his OCD. I was a sexual assault victim at school, unfortunately. And as a result of... Um, not wanting to ever get in trouble again and being summoned to the office, 
I sort of like things to be perfect. Damara's brother, who abused Mick, was convicted but never jailed. For Mick, getting sober will be a show of defiance against him. Finally, that will be my win to get over this, get over this problem which he started in the first place. I will win. I've, I've achieved something and I've, had, I've achieved a goal and I've had a win. And that's the whole point of being here. And then I'll get on with the rest of my life, which is stage three. Enjoy it. Denise was also expecting to be alone today. But she's had some surprise visitors. Her longtime friend Karen and Karen's mum Dossie. She's, she picked me up from down the, the street. For 10 years, they were like family to Denise until they had to ask her to move out. Just the stress and the worry finally just became too much, you know, for myself and um, for my mum to cope with because, you know, I love Denise to bits and, um, and worrying about that the car's out and that she be drinking and getting phone calls from work from her boss, you know, that she's collapsed and she's in hospital and um, running, running head on into a tree and... Oh, that's enough. Oh, OK. Not over Sunday lunch. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Denise thought she'd lost Karen as a friend, but today's visit has given her hope that their bond will endure. I didn't expect you to come after all the... I suppose trouble, there, of course, but I think we're having a much better chance of a proper friendship now. I might just want to use the knife just to spread it out. As visitors' day winds down, James and his parents are looking like a family. James seems a changed man, but his mum knows the real test is waiting for him in the big bad world outside because that's what we need to do, is work out strategies for how do we manage situations, oh, individual yeah. situations, once we're out of here. Because yeah. in here, it's perfect. You know? It's a controlled environment. Mm. It's all about, it's once I leave here, how I cope and how I manage my emotions is the hardest part. How I do all of that how I would work out instead of being angry, show, like being able to show my emotions instead of just getting frustrated and swearing and throwing stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm trying to learn in here. I'll put it as a footnote if I'm not working Saturday mornings. With the visitors gone, the addicts are concentrating on their recovery again. They're all with him, half an hour one way. And Mick and Denise are now on day 27, so they're working on their aftercare plans. Every hour of every day must be mapped out so boredom or depression doesn't set in and kickstart a relapse. As part of their recovery, the addicts are also advised to attend regular Alcoholics or Narcotics Anonymous meetings. And I've just highlighted the things that I have to worry about. While Mick's completed his plan, Denise has be barely easy. begun. I thought you had had yours done. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I was going to cheat off you. No, I'm not good with small boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Big ideas in small boxes. <laughs> Meanwhile, some unwelcome news has turned James's thoughts to the ever-present threat of relapse. He's heard that heroin addict Jean-Paul has broken off contact with his outpatient program. It's not a good sign for Jean-Paul's recovery. He was like, probably one of the biggest inputs to my change, from like listening to some of his stories of what's happened to him through his days. I don't want to go through the same line of same type of life as him. I want to only be in here once and then get on with my life and start a career and everything. As they spend their last night in rehab, Denise, Tim 
James and Mick are thinking about their chances of recovery and hoping tomorrow will mark the start of a new chapter in their lives. Dawn breaks over the Victorian Addiction Centre. It's a day when four of the addicts will finish their program and be released into the world outside. I'm just looking forward to it. I'm cooking. Mick's preparing to say goodbye to the friends he's made in rehab. If you don't know him from a bar of soap, you know, 28 days ago, but you do become quite close because everyone's in the same boat, especially the other two that started the same day, the program the same day as me. We're really close. Denise is also at the end of her stay and believes she can stay clear of the drink and the pokies. I'm coming to see that you can come to a place like this, take the messages, start to put it into your life and just resume your life. How are you feeling today, James? Oh, Tim's waking up his friend James. Yeah. Wakey, wakey, hands off, snakey. They've both come a long way in 28 days it's and now it's time to put their new skills to the test. Once you leave rehab, that's when the real work starts. Once you leave rehab, you walk out the gates and, you know, you're on your own, really. You've got to take what you've learned from this place and put it into practice. Yes. All the best, mate. You look, look after yourself. Yeah. You've got to be able to get through this. These four addicts have spent a month supporting each other, but from today, they'll all be on their own. My God, this is big. This is really big, just spending 28 days in here and going to live somewhere else. It's a big, big move. I want to continue on with the stuff that I've learned here and continue on in life. You take care, be careful, be very, very careful. Okay. Yeah, you just be careful. I don't want to get back into drugs. I've been through that stage in my life and I don't want to end up back in another rehab for 28 days and be stuck here for 28 days, thinking far out, why did I do it again? Come here, you. Yeah, we've got it. Let me see Yeah. Yeah. I've had some of my biggest learnings with you. Have you really? Yeah. I'm just a pony, pony. Oh, yeah. Oh. I miss you. I hate sexually. But we've still got a cab ride yet. We have. We have got a cab ride, yeah. but we'll get this out of the way. I'm going to be standing in the middle of the street somewhere <laughs> doing this. And you're crying. You don't have a light, do you, Princess? No. Oh. Tim's friend Michelle, who left rehab a week ago, has arrived to take him to his new home. Bye, VAC. <laughs> See you later, VAC. For Tim and the other addicts, today is a milestone. They've stayed clean through 28 days of rehab. But are they prepared for the temptations that lie outside the gate? Next time on Addiction, the recovering addicts return to their homes and their routines. This is where the stuff I've learned needs to be put into action. But this time, they'll be trying to do it sober. If I was drinking, that's where I'd be, standing at the front with the cigarette smokers. It's a harsh dose of reality, and out of these four, two will succumb to temptation within a week. It can be incredibly difficult at times to, to see them go out and, and, and not achieve what they're wanting to achieve. And during the manor's final days as a rehab... I can't really... I can't cope anymore. Like... The fight against addiction continues. I'm determined to do it this time now. I have to for the kids. It was all my fault. Bottle of vodka, bottle of brandy, couple of bottles of Chardonnay six pack of beer and then I'd get thirsty.